On Palm Sunday 2006, Father Joe Walieski, a priest of the Diocese of La Crosse, Wisconsin, celebrated the beginning of Holy Week with the children and staff of Casa Ogar, the orphanage he founded and helped build some 20 years previous. From that first day to this Sunday, Casa Ogar and Father Joe had served, many believe had saved, a countless number of children, providing for them not only a bed and a meal, but also a family and a home and a future and a faith. Just two days after this procession and mass, Padre Jose Walieski was called home to the Lord. He was a humble, holy priest for 56 years. He served in Wisconsin, Ecuador, Bolivia, and Peru. He lived with and loved some of the most impoverished people in South America. Every child who lived at Casa Ogar at the time of his passing attended the funeral, as did most every child now adult who had lived at the orphanage previously. Thousands of people came to pay their respects, from Lorene, the home of the orphanage, from nearby communities, including VL Salvador, even some from the other countries where he had once served. For wherever Father Joe had been, he had an impact. There were so many people who wanted to pray one final time with Padre Jose that his wake lasted one full week. Father Joe Walieski gave to his people hope. In some cases, he introduced his people to Christ. In all cases, he taught them about Christ. And to those who came to say goodbye and to walk him to his eternal rest, he was their friend, their mentor, their father or grandfather figure, their teacher, their priest, and a few on this day would even whisper, he was their saint. Joseph Walieski was born in Grand Rapids, Michigan in 1924. In this neighborhood, where most of the families were poor, Polish, and Catholic, and living in this small home with his parents and eight brothers and sisters. Frank and Mary Walieski raised a loving and Catholic family, but it was Mary in particular who took the lead role in providing for the children their faith foundation. She had a deep devotion to St. Joseph, an allegiance which would indeed impact and influence the life of her son, Joseph. The children grew up during the Great Depression, so they were poor, just like every other family they knew. And Joe, who later in life would describe himself as a street kid as a boy, was selling newspapers at age six to help the family with finances. Their parish was the Basilica of St. Adelbert, as the locals pronounced it, located near downtown Grand Rapids. It was in this basilica where many years later, Father Joe would celebrate his first mass, and 50 years beyond that, he would return again for his golden anniversary mass. As a boy, Joe saw the movie Boys Town, and it was in this film where young Joe first took to heart what Father Flanagan at Boys Town preached and how he lived that in the face of the poor and troubled and marginalized, one can see the face of Christ. And that stayed with Joe literally forever. I think the impact that Father Joe's upbringing had during the Depression, coming from a large, poor Polish immigrant family, really did affect his priesthood and the way he looked upon the poor. That combined with his recollection of the movie Boys Town, and Father Flanagan helped him to not only see Christ in the poor, but to bring Christ to the poor. It was at this early stage in his life when Joe Walieski knew two things. 
He knew poverty because of the era in which he grew up. And he knew one day he would be a priest, helping the poor and the orphan, just like the priest in the movie. Academically, including first at St. Adelbert grade school, Joe would struggle, largely because he grew up in a Polish-speaking family. His studies remained difficult in high school and in seminary because of the added requirement to learn Latin. Thus, his path to the priesthood was challenging. Twice, he was told he did not possess the intellect for the priesthood, and he was instructed that if he truly wanted to continue, he must either join an order or find another diocese to sponsor his final years of formation. Joe knew this was not their call. He knew it was God's call. He'd already heard it. So he persisted and he prayed. And in his prayer life, he promised the Lord five years of missionary service if he would just get him to ordination. He wrote to other bishops asking to be accepted to seminary in their diocese. Each letter began with this. May I present for your excellency's kind consideration my application for adoption into the diocese of, and later he would offer, may I add that I can speak the English and Polish languages fluently. Only one bishop responded, Alexander McGavick, realizing how effective a Polish priest would be in a diocese with a sizable Polish population, gratefully welcomed Joe Walieski as a student of the Diocese of La Crosse. The bishop sent him to St. Francis Seminary in Milwaukee. It was here Joe would finish his seminary years. And from this chapel, he was returned to serve the Diocese of La Crosse with these words from the faculty vote on recommendation to holy orders. Joe Walieski may not be the most intelligent priest, but he will be a holy priest. Joe Walieski was ordained in La Crosse in 1950, and he said becoming a priest in the first place, considering his academic struggles and being told to find a new diocese, plus the fact that he received holy orders in the Cathedral of St. Joseph, the saint for whom his mother held such a deep devotion, he said that a new ordination day was proof of the hand of God at work in his life. Father Joe was a priest for over half a century. He served in Wisconsin for only 14 of those years, including the first six. But he always acknowledged how much he loved the people of his diocese and how he appreciated their hospitality and their support and especially their prayers. And they loved him, not only for his obvious passion to serve Christ, but also for his humility and simplicity and his humor. He'd come down in the morning for uh, getting ready for Mass. He'd say, top of the morning to you. And if you didn't answer, and the rest of the day to you, he would point his finger and say, and the rest of the day to you. So always a man of joy. Sometimes as bishop, I would caution him about this or that or the other thing. <laughs> he would always say to me, Bishop, you have a point. It's a bit prickly, but you have a point. In other words, he would, it was his way of saying you know, that it wasn't so easy for him to accept, but he would then. He was, he's a very humble man. Always close to Father Joe's heart in these early Wisconsin years, however, was his previous promise to serve Christ as a missionary. He could not and would not let that go. He knew God was calling him to do much more and far away. So when Pope Pius XII released his Fidei Donum document, The Gift of Faith, encouraging priests to embrace missionary work, Father Joe felt as if the Pope was speaking directly to him. He approached his bishop, John Patrick Tracy, asking permission to serve as a missionary in South America, one of the locations mentioned by Pius XII. And a year later, after asking Joe to continue to pray about it, the bishop approved. Father Joe once wrote this to the bishop who accepted him to Wisconsin. I owe my whole life's work to the Diocese of La Crosse. I was on the verge of despair in my attempts in seeking a diocese that would adopt me as one of their sons. At last, I am an orphan no more. It was 1956, and for the first time and for a long time, Father Joe Walieski was leaving behind 
his beloved home diocese of La Crosse, Wisconsin. Father Walieski first served as a missionary priest in Santa Cruz, Bolivia. There, the local bishop guided him and others to a remote jungle area, and he gave to each of them, including this small and humble priest from far away Wisconsin, a machete, and they cleared space for a church. That was just the start, because soon Father Joe had to go to Brazil by train to buy the cement. When a bridge was out, he helped carry the heavy cement bags across a river where they loaded the bags onto another train to go to Santa Cruz. But never one to quit, never one to get discouraged, Father Joe made it happen. He got it done and he built that church. He had a way of coming into the strange town, for example, and uh, convincing all these men to do this Herculean job of moving tons of cement across the river and, and onto a, a flat car on the other side. Uh, I think that's just an example of uh, the way uh, he, he dealt with things. It, it just, uh, well, he did what had to be done and, uh, and he did it in a very quiet, um, a gentle manner. Que cuando el padre vino aquí a fundar esta parroquia, when Padre Jose came here to build the church and school, it was an enormous project. There was nothing here. The people lived in shacks. Everybody was in poverty. When he built the church, everybody moved close to church because it was the only church here. People came from everywhere to be close to his church, to be close to him. When he was building the church at, uh, at Santa Cruz, he lived in a barn with livestock. I mean, he went in there, that's, that's the place where he, you know, set up a bed of straw and, and, and you, know, you know, you can imagine what it was, was like, but for months. Father Joe built and founded the church, even though during the early construction phase, the walls of the new church fell three times. He believed even that was providential. He said, just as Christ himself fell three times under the weight of his cross, then so too should this new church with the name Holy Cross. When construction began, the local bishop told Father Walieski that if he built a church in this remote location, that the people will come and build their homes next to it. Well, that was then, and this is now. Today, over a million people live in Santa Cruz, and as predicted by the bishop six decades ago, Holy Cross Parish is just one block from the city center. The church founded and built by Father Joe is still standing. Now it's the Padre Jose Parish Hall. It's used for meetings and social events. The new Holy Cross Church is right next door. <laughs> Cross Parish educates over 2,000 students in its school, which was also founded by Father Joe, and the parish priests administer the sacraments and serve over 50,000 parishioners. This Holy Cross Parish in Santa Cruz, Bolivia is alive and vibrant today, all because of one man who 60 years ago heard and responded to God's call. And this pencil in the Lord's hand was just getting started. Father Joe, always obedient to the bishop back home, left Bolivia and returned to Wisconsin, where for several years he would serve in parishes as administrator, associate pastor, and eventually as pastor. 
But when a massive earthquake struck Peru in 1970, Father Joe heard again the call to serve as a missionary. So he asked for and received permission to go to Peru to assist the survivors. And with this tragedy began perhaps the most remarkable phase of Padre Jose's life with the hand of God so clearly at work. He settled in Villa El Salvador, the city of the Savior. At that time, it was a place of extreme poverty with the people living in shanties built of cardboard and straw mats. Father Walieski embraced those who lived in these conditions and he recognized this as his next call from God. He would serve in Peru for the rest of his life. He requested from the Cardinal to be the pastor of the, this group of settlers that um, came from the mountains and settled on the piece of desert outside Lima, Peru. And so there was nothing there, literally nothing. But for the poverty, literally nothing, including no Catholic churches. So Father Joe, just as he had done in Bolivia, gathered volunteers and led the effort to build not only a large parish, Christ the Savior, but also eight smaller chapels located throughout El Salvador. And for nearly 100,000 people, Father Joe would be their one priest. One of the chapels at the suggestion of the new parishioners and with the approval of the bishop was named after St. Joseph. And for Father Joe, this was just another example of divine providence. He often said he was just a pencil in our Lord's hand. He held strong the conviction that everything he accomplished was by the hand of God and through the grace of God. It was a belief he traced back to his mother, who in her deep devotion to St. Joseph, so admired his simplicity and reliability and obedience to God, traits that she would come to recognize in her son, Joseph. In her prayer life, Mary Walieski would ask three things of St. Joseph. One, that she would have a son, whom she would name Joseph, who would become a priest. That prayer was answered on Ordination Day 1950. Two, that her son, Father Joseph, would one day build a church in honor of St. Joseph. That prayer was answered in Viel Salvador, Peru. And three, that when it was time for God to call her home, that please, she would pray, Please let her die on the feast day of St. Joseph. And remarkably, on March 19, 1971, she did. All these things believe Father Joe because of the hand of God. It says here that it was on this place that they celebrated a mass with the local cardinal from Lima, a place in which for the first time there was celebrated a mass, 1224, December 24th, 1971, by the Cardinal Juan Landa, Landasuri, recognizing the first pastor, Padre Jose Balieski, attended by nine children, five women, two men, and 15 dogs. That same Christ the Savior Church, Cristo El Salvador, which was founded by Father Joe some 50 years ago, is not only still standing today, but it has become the church and parish with the largest congregation in V. El Salvador. 65,000 parish members, 16,000 families, a kindergarten for over 100 children, and two food kitchens preparing over 600 lunches every week for the poor. Just as Father Joe had planned, just as Father Joe had prayed five decades before. Padre Jose never ran from the poverty which surrounded him here or anywhere. Rather, he confronted it. He was once resting inside the rectory when he was interrupted by the sound of a soccer ball being kicked against the wall. So he went outside and he asked the boy with the ball, why are you not at lunch? And he heard this reply. Padre, hoy día no me toca comer. Father, it's not my turn to eat today. Father Joe would not accept that. He would not stand still. He would not stand aside. He never did. So he began a series of soup stations located throughout Viel Salvador, 
which are still in operation today, still feeding the kids and now even feeding the adults. A few of these women worked this soup kitchen with Padre Jose. He told them he was doing God's work. Now that he's gone, they say they're doing God's work for him. They work every day. They accept no salary. Often they don't even know where the resources for the next day's meals will come from, but they still find strength and inspiration from what Father Joe would often tell them when he was there, that God will provide. Father Joe was now feeding the poor and hungry of El Salvador, Peru. But when he saw children sleeping under newspapers on the streets, each time an experience he would not and could not forget, he was then determined to one day build for these kids and those like them a place to live. In order for him to build an orphanage, however, in the midst of the poverty of Peru, first divine providence would step in once again, and this time it would take him to Poland. An estimated three million people saw Pope John Paul II when he visited his home country of Poland in 1979. Three million people, including Father Joe, who hoped not only to see the Pope, but also to meet the Pope. He knew it was unlikely, perhaps even impossible, but Father Joe wanted an opportunity to tell the Holy Father about his people in Peru. He had a friend in the Pope's traveling party, Archbishop Marchinkos, and he told Father Joe to stand at a specific location on a specific day, and as the papal entourage approached, Marchinkos saw Walieski, briefly spoke to John Paul II, and sure enough, the Pope changed direction and approached Father Joe. Their face-to-face -face meeting occurred, just one Polish priest talking to another. Father Joe asked the Pope to bless a loaf of bread, a Polish tradition. He told him about his work with the poor in Peru, and never one to be shy, he invited John Paul II to visit him in VL Salvador. And in 1985, he did. Pope John Paul II not only went to Peru, but on his schedule, he included a visit to VL Salvador, Father Joe's home, and even went so far as to give Father Joe the honor of introducing him to the massive crowd gathered there to hear him speak. Le damos gracias. So once again, these two Polish priests were together, this time a half a world away from where they first met. The Pope saw up close the extreme poverty of which Father Joe spoke. He listened as Father Joe told him about the parish and the chapels and the soup kitchens he had built, and of his dream to one day build an orphanage. And as John Paul II was leaving, he gave to the Cardinal of Lima a $50,000 donation with the instructions to use it to help the poor. And the Cardinal quickly decided who better to help the poor than Padre Jose Walieski. And Father Joe, again recalling the powerful example of Boys Town from his childhood and the more recent experiences of seeing the kids sleeping under newspapers, Father Joe used that donation from his friend the Pope to build his orphanage, which he would name Casa Ogar Juan Pablo II the house home of John Paul II. So this simple, humble Polish priest from Wisconsin meets the Pope, a future saint, in Poland in the middle of three million people. They visit again a decade later in the poverty of Peru, and the Pope is so moved, he leaves behind the funding which would later be used to help build an orphanage. Hand of God. The poverty in Peru was still very much in the mind of Pope John Paul II when he returned to Rome. He sends one of his cardinals down who was writing his encyclical on poverty and wanted him to get a first-hand appreciation of the poor. When Father Joe um, met with the cardinal, and he, he said, I want to take you up to the area. Well, he took her to a, a lady who was dying from end-stage bone cancer. And so she was relegated to her her bed, and she was in um, a house which actually was a shack. I mean, we, and to say the shack, that might be more a mansion-like um, image in our mind. So we're talking plywood and, and cardboard boxes that form the walls, and here's this woman in bed, and she's got the catechism of the Catholic. She's teaching children about the church. Well, the cardinal goes in, and he is so, so taken by this demonstration that he, he leaves crying. 
you know, Joe, of course, is consoling him that he, you know, um, on this, that Cardinal was Joseph Ratzinger. You know? So here's, here's Joe Walieski, who is not supposed to be a priest, influencing two popes and being an example in serving the poor. Casa Ogar was constructed just one year after the Pope's visit to Peru. It was built in Lorene, very close to Via El Salvador. And it was not just for kids without parents. Father Joe, this pastor of the poor, this witness for Christ and his commandment to love one another, Father Joe also welcomed kids without homes and kids without hope so that they too would be an orphan no more. This was big news in Peru. Never before had they seen a man quite like Father Joe. Never before had they received a gift quite like Casa Ogar. Today, Casa Ogar continues to serve the Lorreen community, still providing hope and a home, still taking the kids from squalor to salvation. There is a new generation of men and women who serve here, all dedicated to Father Joe's belief that their mission is to provide for the children a path to their mother, the church and to receive from her the restoration of their dignity and the means for their salvation. Father Joe envisioned for them what they now have, a family structure, groups of either eight boys or eight girls living in their own space, headed by a mother and a father. The children are tutored here in addition to attending the local school, and for most, their knowledge of and relationship with Christ begins here. This is their home. This is their family. And because of Father Walieski and those who followed him, they have a future and it's grounded in faith. Father Joe was director at Casa Ogar for over 15 years and always with his beloved Lady of Chestahova nearby. She is behind the altar inside the small Casa Ogar chapel. He often spoke of his love for the Blessed Mother and of his admiration to this particular image. He once said, if anyone had told me I'd be the father to over 80 children at a time, I wouldn't have believed it, but I love it. This was my dream. I said, do you need a pediatrician? And he says, yes, but how much are you going to charge me? And I said, no, father, how much I'm going to pay you for allowing me to be a pediatrician of the of La Casa Hogar. He was a regular saint. He was a saint. He was not human. In other words, human beings are, they go until they can. He went farther than that. Everybody here who knew him for a long time, we know he was a saint. He was different from anybody we ever met. He had something special in him. He inspired us to follow his example because he was following Christ's example. Father Joe remained a joyful and active priest in his final years. He'd often drive deep into the rainforest to teach the Yasha Ninkas Indians about Jesus and to introduce them to Mass and the Eucharist. He also had one more building project left inside of him. At age 81, he founded the St. Joseph Retirement Home in a remote area many hours away from where he started in Peru. He arranged for the home to be run by consecrated women religious. In his final years, Padre Jose would often say that the greatest joy of being a Christian is to know you can serve others. He wanted to, quote, die with my shoes on, he would say. He wanted to work and serve literally until the day he would die, which he did. He served right up until that 2006 Palm Sunday Mass, just two days before he passed. During his life as a priest, he would jokingly tell people, in a reference to the everyday challenges encountered by a missionary, don't worry, nothing will be all right. But in his final hours, he smiled assuredly to those gathered around him, 
and he reinforced one final time his belief in divine providence when he said, don't worry, everything will be all right. Joe Waliaski was totally and completely dependent upon the grace of God. He, he knew that without God's help, without God's grace, um, he, was, he was nothing. He would, he would not accomplish anything. But he was the kind of priest who knew, who was dependent upon God's grace every day of his life, and he knew God's grace was real. On the event of his death, <laughs> I would see, you know, many of the saints saying, he, he comes up here now. You know, he, he belongs here with us and without any, without any hesitation. And he used that image that he said, I'm just a pencil in the hand of God. But that's a, 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 a beautiful image in the sense that we are all our stewards. Whatever gifts God has given us, those are given to us for, to give him glory and to serve our neighbor. And, and that's how Father Wolieski, Father Joe understood that. Father gives us that example of, of, of trusting completely in our Lord. Give your heart to Him, trust in Him completely, and He'll use even your poor gifts or your limited gifts to do powerful things. There's this prayer we pray that we have more priests, that we have holy priests, that we have more holy priests. That, that was a, a prayer in Spanish that they, I'm sure they say to this day. Well, Father Joe was surely that, the holy priest. But I had the opportunity to spend a whole day with Father Joe, and he took us everywhere. We went up into the barrios where the people live, and they've got dirt floors, and they come running. And then we went to Villa El Salvador to see his first parish. And a lady was coming out of church, and she saw him, and she, she got down on her knees practically crying. You, you are astounded. I, I can't even begin to tell you, because just watching how the people react to him, it's like, who is this man? I think when we got back on the plane, the gal I was traveling with, I said, you wonder where Jesus is? Guess what? He's in Peru. But when you take a, a particular type of life, like Father Joe Wileski, everybody's able to look back and to be able to see moments that the Holy Spirit has worked as, and used this man as an instrument. The old gospel, uh, you know, passage, God takes the weak and the foolish, you know, to confound the proud and the arrogant and the wealthy. And here we have, here we have that um, in Father Joe. And there were people immediately down there that said, the world had Mother Teresa and we had Father Joe. You know, so that's what, the, that's the level that they put this guy at. The world had, you know, Mother Teresa. We have, we have Father Joe. We got up here because we were celebrating the fifth anniversary of Father Joe's death. And the kids came up and there was, you could hear, you could, there was no noise up here. There was nothing. These children came up and each one, each one placed a candle. The little ones, the little kids were helped by the big kids. And every one of them was as reverent as could be. They were astonishingly reverent. They came up here and they knew who was here. They knew that Father Joe was here. It was an encounter with somebody who really did something wonderful. And, and it was an encounter that they had with, with Jesus through Father Joe. You know, I looked up at this magnificent statue of the Blessed Mother and realizing this is a holy man. 
This is the kind of guy who has touched lives, but touched lives because these kids don't have anything. And all of a sudden he gave them something. He gave them, he gave them a sense of themselves. He gave them a sense of their dignity. He gave them a sense of understanding that they were children of God. Here, in that moment, I realized he's, he's touched hearts, he's touched lives, the way Jesus touched lives. In 2013, at the Cathedral of St. Joseph the Workman in La Crosse, Wisconsin, this Mass celebrated the opening of the cause for beatification and canonization of Father Joseph Walieski. The opening took place on March 19th, the feast day of St. Joseph. Holy and good God, your servant and priest, Father Joseph Walieski, through priestly zeal and heroic holiness, defended innocence against the sadness of evil, especially to broken families and helpless children. Imaging the compassionate Christ, he led others to the font of sacramental life and the knowledge of Jesus Christ as their true and only Savior. Heavenly Father, we humbly pray you to raise up your servant, Father Joseph Walieski, whose joyful priestly heart was resolute in the heart of Christ Jesus, to the courts of heaven, and through your Holy Spirit, who guides and leads the church, give him to us as a saint and a hero of this generation. Through this example, may there be a new urgency of souls for Christ. Through his intercession, I humbly ask, through Christ our Lord, Amen. The current director at Casa Ogar is Monsignor Joe Hirsch, who, like Father Walieski, is a priest of the Diocese of La Crosse, Wisconsin. And in the courtyard of his small home inside the walls of Casa Ogar, I spoke to him about life today at the orphanage and about the lessons he learned from Father Joe. Monsignor Hirsch, uh, thank you for your hospitality shown to all of us this week. It's been a pleasure to be with you and to be with the kids. The kids are uh, hard not to love, aren't they? I always love to have people come over because it's an automatic. I, I don't have to sell anything. Yeah. Just to be with the kids, that takes care of everything. Tell us about the setup here. I mean, you know, how do you place the kids? What kind of living uh, environment do they have? Just, just go through the nuts and bolts for us. Well, first of all, the setup that we have is based on a model of family. And Father Jose, his point was, if we're going to transform society, we've got to we've got to teach kids what it's like to be a family. And having watched Boys Town when yeah. he was a kid, that was always his inspiration. So this house here is built on eight families. So it's a big building with four bottom apartments that are made for boy families. And there's eight children in each family. So that's 32. And on the second floor, we have four families for girls. And so that's another 32. So we have a capacity for 64 young people. Is it a revolving door? Or once you get a child, are they pretty much here until age 17? We make a commitment to the child that we will be here for you, you till you're 17. Now, sometimes the family situation gets better. And when the family situation gets better, they may say, you know, we'd like to have our child come back home. Yeah. I consider that a success. If a child, sometimes a child doesn't like the rules. Well, you know how kids are sometimes, because they look at the life in the street and it's easy. You can party, you can do whatever you like. Here, there's a strict program of learning abilities. If you're gonna get into society, you gotta get to this point. And if you stay in the street, you'll never make it. Some of the kids can only see this far. And so they say, this isn't fun, I wanna get out. But it's on occasion, sometimes a child leaves because they just wanna have freedom. Inevitably, they will come back two years later, three years later and say that was a big yeah, mistake. Yeah. 
I think that leads to the next the question I had for you. The few things I've noticed in my short time here, A, how responsible the kids are in that family environment. They all have jobs, they all have chores, they're expected to do things around the house to help mom and dad, correct? So does that come from you? Does that come from mom and dad? Does that come from the other kids well, in the family? Come, well, it comes from the program. Mm -hmm. Because the whole program of Boys Town is saying, there are abilities you need to learn. And so we have like five different levels of development before you leave here. And and so you learn these, these, these basic skills in human relationships, just something like look the person in the yeah. eye. Yeah. You gotta be able to say thank you. You gotta be able to present yourself. One thing that people notice right away, kids come up, they look at you and yeah. they shake your hand. Yeah. Hello, my name is Juan Carlos. Yeah. It's nice to meet you. What is your name? And when they say goodbye, they do the same yeah. thing. And that's, that's universal here. That, uh, that's what I'm gonna go home with. I don't get that in the States. No, I don't either. No, no. every child here, you have 64 children and, and their moms and dads, every one of them, if they see you walking down the sidewalk or walking into the kitchen or into church, they shake your hand and they tell you again who they are. I think that's remarkable. I'm thinking of a girl who now lives in Italy from here. Yeah. And she told me before she left, she said, you know, I, I feel more confident because I know the abilities that a person needs to have to get a job. And I know how to shake their hand. I know how to look at them. I know how to present myself. She said, a lot of kids in the street don't know how to do that. Yeah, yeah. She said, I learned that here at Casa. They dress up for mass. I noticed that too. That's... They've got their best on. Right. This morning at, at 8 a.m. Mass, with all the kids there, you gave a homily, referred back to Father Joe, the founder of Casa, mm -hmm. and you gave it in Spanish, so I didn't catch a whole lot of it, but the two things I caught were perseverance and patience. Can you go over that again? Because I think that's not just a homily for the kids to hear, but for all of us. There, first of all, the reading today was talking about hope as an anchor and that you've got to be able to hope not just part way, but all the way to the end. So when I looked at that reading, I was thinking of Father Jose, because for Father Joe Valieski, he was someone who, he always spoke of those qualities of patience and perseverance, and he lived it out in his life. As a missionary, nothing ever goes well. Everything always takes time. Today I had a 10 minute appointment and it took an hour and a half, and that's, that's the way that it, it always goes. And so in the homily, I was talking to the kids in saying, we have only a couple of years here in this house, and it's going to be very important to learn patience and perseverance. Father Jose would say, if you're gonna be a missionary, if you're gonna follow Christ, you need three qualities. Number one, you need patience. Number two, you need, when that runs out, you need more patience. Number three, when that runs out, you need even more patience. And uh, you look at the life of Father Jose, like when he went to Brazil to get the cement for Santa Cruz and all the other things that he did, everything thing took 10,000 times longer. And yet it never got him down. He always, okay, that's the way it is. That leads me to the other saying. That saying, he says, don't worry, nothing ever turns out well. It sounds cynical, yeah. but actually it's, it's rather unique because he, when, people, when he sees people getting impatient, he says, get over it everything takes 10 times longer. So if you're going to be a missionary, nothing turns out well. So be happy anyway, be able to work in that chaos. And many times I find, even as, as we're dealing with legalities and all these long-term things, I'll look at the other volunteers and say, it's okay, we're missionaries, mm -hmm. we'll adapt. And that's all based on Father Jose. Don't worry, nothing ever turns out well. The other thing I said in the homily then was that Father Jose on the last day of his life, when the, Alfredo came to visit him, the last guy that saw him alive, he, when he said goodbye, he said, don't worry, everything will turn out well. It's the only time he changed it that I ever knew of. And so when he changed it, 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 it just put the cap on his life, that he was patient to the end, and Alfredo left, he read his prayers, put the ribbon in, closed his book, went to sleep, and woke up in heaven. And so in talking with the kids, I was saying how important it is for you as young people, not just to be holy or good or healthy, living, learning the abilities that you learn right here at Casa. You're gonna to need to learn that to be able to live it over here. And that there's different steps that you make. You need to practice that here but you're going on vacation in another couple of days. You're gonna be living with maybe grandma, grandpa, uncle, aunt, or whatever family system you have. 
when I, the indicator that I have that you're moving to the next level is when you start practicing this faithfulness, this patience, this perseverance, when you go home. For example, I said, getting to Mass on Sunday, praying, being honest, working on the skills with your own family members, lifting them up. Uh, when you start practicing that in your biological family system, then I know that you're moving from here to here. But many of them wouldn't see that in their biological family system. Oh no, because... So how do you overcome that? That's why they have to learn it so they can begin to plant seeds in a very difficult environment because they might have people shouting at them and they have to maintain calm. That's one of the skills they have to learn is how to maintain, maintain calm when people, are, when people are very angry with you. When somebody's bullying you or picking a fight, you have to be able to maintain calm. Tell me, Monsignor, about reverse mission. And I have a feeling that that impacts you too. Yes. Yeah. For, for Father Jose, back in the mid 90s, he said, here I am a missionary. I spend my whole life in South America but nobody really knows the missions. Just a couple people, and they only know it because of whatever preaching I do. And, and, and so I go into parishes, they give me some money, and they figure that they've learned about the missions by giving me money. But he said, there's so much more they could learn. He said, I would love to have young people go down to the missions. And if they could go down to the missions, they could become ambassadors but first of all, they have to learn what it is to have a missionary spirituality. If they can learn how to be missionaries in Peru and then come back and be missionaries back in, in Wisconsin or wherever they go, he said, then we're going to transform society and not just give donations. Yeah. And so his inspiration was to bring young people down to Casa. And so we started bringing young people down in 94, 96, 98, 01. There were a couple other groups outside of that, but those were the groups that I led. And, and then little by little, by 04, we, it, this started to spread. And I handed it off to a couple other priests. And now we averaged six, this year, eight different groups coming down. Besides that, individuals coming down for kind of phase two for longer mission experiences that these young people come back and their lives are markedly different when they go back to the U.S. So it's not just, and I know you have, you rely a lot on volunteers. They come down for a week or two at a time from the home diocese of La Crosse. It's not just, hey, we appreciate your help. We love you for helping us once or twice a, a year. Reverse mission is taking it home with you. Reverse mission is trying to live your, your life every day in that spirit. Every time that somebody comes here for a period of time, you'll, you'll receive this as well. Yeah. We'll be giving you a cross, a mission cross, and a necklace made by the kids. And then we will give you a blessing and saying, now, you take the mission here and you take it back to wherever mm -hmm. you are. We do that with every person that comes down. And if you're able to spend a couple of months here, then it goes even much deeper. But our questions are, are not just how can you help the kids, our questions are, are how is this changing you as a person? And how does this put the fire in you? Because see, as, as people, we need to have a fire in us that, that doesn't just last for five years or a short time. It's gotta to go to the end of our life, as we see in Father Jose. And to be a missionary like that, we need to, we need to plant that seed I love using the stories of Father Jose because he's, he's like the, the local saint that we can use his story. And, and then I see the kids going home and say, I, I wanna live that kind of life and I wanna be able to inspire. We've gotta inspire young people. If we don't inspire them, then they will continue in mediocrity. Uh, Casa has two hearts. I heard you referring to that the other night. Was that a Father Jose uh, belief or does that come from Monsignor? He, he always spoke of the heart of the family that that is a very, they've got to learn the love of a mom and a dad if they are going to be future moms and dads. But he also spoke about how the chapel, it is, it is in the, at mass, it is at prayer, that they will learn who Jesus Christ is. And, and so he would, he would often mention that as well. When you come here, you are coming into the, I, I don't know if he used two hearts, but I use the image of two hearts, uh -huh. but the concept was definitely there with Father Jose. And um, this is the way I put it, is these children have gone through abandonment, neglect. They, some have gone through abuse of all different kinds. They've been deeply, deeply hurt. Their wounds are more, they're deeper than psychological. 
There's a spiritual root that is a deep father wound, deep mother wound. And if all we do is try to psychologize, then we're, we're not going to get to the depths of the healing that they need. And therefore, a lot of our concern is, and how I work with the psychologist here too, is how do we address the psychologically, uh, psychological, but then also how do we address the spiritual? Because for these children to be able to be healed and go into their society, we have to go as deep as we can. And that involves psychological and spiritual. So when I, I invite the kids, they're not forced to come to mass, but I definitely make a real strong pitch for it because I say a couple of aspects to it. Number one, we have to thank the people who make possible our life here. How can we do it? We can pray for them. We can pray for them and that's our thanksgiving to them. And we have a moral obligation to do that. But secondly, this is our spiritual formation. The only chance I have with you besides eating in your families and visiting with you one-on-one -on -one and those kinds of things is there's a definite spiritual formation that I can do with you as we walk with the Lord here at Mass and that the Lord can give to you. Because if you don't encounter Jesus Christ and if that doesn't change your life, then somehow we, we failed in our mission. And so I'm always going to be stressing those two hearts. Padre Jose often said, as you well know, that he was just a pencil in our Lord's hand. I wonder, should we not all believe that as firmly as he did, and in particular you? You never thought you'd be here, correct? A lot of things happened in your life that just, here I am. Should we not all take that, that same attitude? When I was in Bolivia, I started doing a, uh, what's called the dangerous question. And la pregunta peligrosa. We have to get to the kids to a point of faith in which they realize my life is not my own. Once I come to that point, I begin to ask the next question, which is called the dangerous question. That is, Lord, what do you want of me? The dangerous question is the pencil in God's hand. Because the dangerous question is saying, Lord, it's not about me anymore. Mm -hmm. Now you are the source of my being. You are the one who knows my mission. You are the one who I hope, I pray, I trust will reveal it to me in, in time. And therefore I am a pencil in your hands. I will tr live in communion with you. I will strive to seek your will. But now my life is yours. What do you want of me? You want me to be a priest, single, sister, married, whatever it is, I will be that steward and seek your call. When, when we, we ask the dangerous question, then we are living the pencil in God's hands, even though we may not know what it is yet. For many of the children, they're not going to know for a number of years. Yeah. So if, if I can get them comfortable with asking the, the, the dangerous question, then in time they will discover what it means to truly be that pencil. For me in my own life, I met Father Jose when I was 21. I never thought that that would have that big of an impact. But now as I look back, that is a great marker in my life. Doing the mission trips, it's always been in the back of my head to be a missionary. And the door almost opened for Bolivia in 1997, and then it got shut. And then, but I received a definite call. What was all of that? The Lord was preparing, but in all of it, you gotta be asking the dangerous question. And then being satisfied with where the Lord sends you. And I was happy being in the US for 15 more years. Mm -hmm. And then the bishop asked me to, to be a missionary here. I don't see myself as now being a missionary. I've been living that spirituality ever since I've been working with Father Jose. Father, when, uh, or Monsignor, I'm sorry, when, when a boy or girl walks out of here, walks out of Kaz at age 17, whether they've been here a year or 12, your mission has been a, a success if they walk out of here with what? If they come out with a sense of uh, I have some living life skills. I've been ed educated, I've been formed. I know what it means to live in a family. I know how to share. I know how to have brothers and sisters in, in good and healthy relationships. I've learned some the, the skills and how to relate, work, work through problems, communicate, how to be responsible. I've learned to have a discipline in my life beyond my impulses, beyond my preferences. I've learned to be able to set some goals for myself. And, uh, and I've learned something about my faith, that my faith is not simply an externalism in my life, but there is somehow there is this God 
who loves me. I use the phrase with the kids all the time. You are the son of the king. You are the daughter of the king. If they can learn that I am the daughter of a king or the son of a king, there's a God who loves me. They're not going to have their answers yet about where they're going. They're, they're like the wise men who are halfway to Bethlehem. They, they don't have all the answers, but they're on the journey. And if they can be open to the mystery of the journey, open to that we all have to pass through a desert, and they can live in patience and perseverance in that kind of wait, then uh, I say, yeah, this has been a great success. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your hospitality. God bless your work. Uh, it's been, thank it's you been so good much. to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.